So last night I thought I would be clever and I would write up my sermon, which I promptly did. Talk about a fun Saturday night, right? <laughs> Sit around, write a sermon on a Saturday night. And so I did. I wrote this great sermon. Thought I saved it to my cloud. Came into work today to print it and realized it doesn't exist anywhere. <laughs> so, so much for a Saturday night. But maybe it's God's way of saying, well, guess what? You're going to have to preach from the heart. What God forgot is yesterday, somehow I hurt my back, and so I'm standing here <laughs> feeling that as well. So forgive me if I don't entirely make sense at times. There's a danger sometimes when we read and interpret scripture. And the danger is that sometimes we impose upon the text our own feelings and our own thoughts, or we, we begin to think of them as much greater than what they are. Today's gospel is one such example. In recent years, with the rise of stewardship campaigns in churches, this text has become, what shall we say, an example of what we should be giving that the widow is raised up as this person who's so good in that she gives everything she has, while the rest of the group only gives a small portion of what they have. But if you look at the text and culture, to make such a suggestion that the widow is noble and that this is a model of stewardship, is actually deeply troubling. In fact, it raises a serious theological question. Would God really want you to give everything away to the point that you have nothing to live on? Much of the culture and the history of the time has been lost to us. But there's some important details we have to hold in mind when we approach this text. The first of which is the place of widows at the time of Jesus. Now, for most of us, this passes us over. If we hear widow, we simply think of a person who has lost their spouse and is living on their own. But in the culture of Jesus' day, a woman needed to be included in a household with other men. She needed to be under the protection and guard of other men. Otherwise, she would be marginalized and excluded in society. In fact, if you take a look at the crucifixion narratives in John's Gospel, you get that wonderful scene in which Jesus says to John, Behold your mother, and to Mary, behold your son. It wasn't a pious thing. What Jesus was doing was ensuring that his mother would not be exiled and excluded from the community. Because a woman on her own held no status, no rights, and if she wasn't identified somehow or protected within a male household, she would be put out on the street. Yeah, yikes. Who said that? I love that. <laughs> Yikes, thank you. <laughs> that should be a yikes to us. And here we have this woman, this widow, who from what we can tell from historical evidence, was likely sitting on the very edge of the temple, hoping and pleading that somebody would come by and give her some money to survive upon. The temple had certain sections where you would have uh, the blind, the sick, the widows, all those who were marginalized by society, sort of on the fringe, literally on the fringe of things. All desperate for somebody to show hope and to give them hope. The other thing that we have to hold in mind when we approach this text is the larger chapter. See, what we get on Sundays is we get what they call little pericopes, essentially little snippets 
from the Gospels. And the danger of a snippet is that you don't get the whole context. It's like watching a movie or watching a small clip of a movie and thinking you got the whole gist of what's going on in the movie. That's not the case here. This story comes to us from the 12th chapter of Mark. It's a chapter you're probably quite familiar with because it's the chapter in which we hear Jesus give the great lines, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. But more importantly, what is going on in this chapter, and this story concludes it, is Jesus' challenge to the religious authorities of his day and raising a real question about the integrity of the religious life and culture of Israel. Jesus is struck with a problem. He sees people living according to the law. They're embracing the law. The scribes certainly are. They're following all their duties. They're doing the proper worship. Everybody's adhering to the law. If you're familiar with ancient Judaism, ancient Judaism was guided by a long list of law and commands that they must follow and adhere to. The people are doing that. But has it actually radically transformed their life? Has it challenged them to pay attention to the poor, the marginalized, to the suffering in their midst. And this is the problem that Jesus is getting at in this gospel. In fact, Jesus, in a sense, is very much in line with the great prophets of the Old Testament, with Hosea, Micah, Jeremiah, who all raise this question, you can follow the law, you can do everything right, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're loving God's people. You can come to church, you can say all the right prayers, you can do all the right rituals. But if you have outside your temple people who are starving, people who are suffering, and you walk right by them, even worse in this case, if you have them actually giving money to support your lifestyle, the woman was giving money to the treasury. It was supporting the excess. If you allow that, what sort of love do you have? What sort of love do you have? The temptation, I think, for all of us, and this is true for us even today, if we're honest with ourselves, and I will say certainly for me, I'm, I'll just name myself, for example, the temptation is, is that all of us can do all the right things. We can say we believe in all the right things. But has that actually transformed our hearts from hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, as the great prophet Ezekiel says? Has that radically transformed the way we live our lives This is a question that I often find myself wrestling with in my day-to-day -day life. How does my faith impact my relationship with God's people? Do I truly love others in such a way that compels me to do justice and to walk humbly with God, as Micah says? Or do I simply take my faith and do the bare minimum thinking, well, that will justify me, and I'll be safe in the long run, especially when I get to my deathbed, that hopefully I'll get to heaven. But that's not what God is seeking. And while we like to extol the woman, Jesus actually doesn't give her any praise, if you look at that final paragraph. He's actually illustrating the injustice of his time. All he points out a fact, he says, look, they gave all they have, she gave, or they gave the excess, she gave all she had. He doesn't make commentary on it. But the key to understanding what's going on is the first paragraph in which he says, look at these scribes. They dress and look like they're religious people, 
but they steal from widows' houses. And at the end, what do you see? A widow giving everything she had to support their lifestyle, their excess. A lot of us think that the Bible is about doing right and wrong. It's actually not that. The scriptural texts are much, how do I say, much deeper than that. It's not that surface level of doing right and wrong and getting a reward and punishment depending on what you do. That's not, not what it's about. What it's about is radical love. Embracing God's love, a God who gives of himself, a God who gives of God's self totally and freely to us out of love, that we respond to God with that same type of love, and we do so in loving all of God's people and creation. And not just by doing the bare minimum, but authentically and truly giving of ourselves as gift to others. And if our religious practices inhibit our ability to give of ourselves totally and completely, we really have to ask ourselves whether those practices are right. And I think this is something that we in the church today have to wrestle with. In some ways, I look at our own faith community and wonder that maybe we have an opportunity before us now to truly be concerned with the welfare and the good of the people around us. Sure, we lost a beautiful church, but how much money was going in to sustain that building? Was it a museum place? Or was it a place where hearts were transformed? I'm not making judgment there. Did it allow us to show tenderness, love, and compassion to the poor and the marginalized in our midst? I don't know. But what I do know is that the God of Jesus Christ is actually inviting you and I to truly love as God loves and to be attentive to the marginalized to the homeless, to the disenfranchised, that if we truly say we love God, then that love must transform everything we do in our lives. We can say all the prayers we want, but that isn't what's going to get it, but rather a radical love for all. Amen.